Peter. So I will be running the meeting until he gets here. I would like to welcome the committee, the uh, superintendent, and other administrators. Um, the AEA representative, Siobhan Foley. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the uh, wonderful things about the Arlington Public Schools is we've developed a sister city relationship uh, with the schools in Nagaoka Kewa. It came starting in 2004 when the official municipal visit came, and we looked at it and said, you know, this would really be very meaningful uh, if, if this were a program that involved kids. And uh, uh, my colleague on the school committee at the time, uh, Sue Scheffler, was really the engine on our side to, to get this thing going. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, our former colleague, a former member, Sue Scheffler, to talk about this year's uh, visit in student exchange. Thank you very much. Do I need to push this? No, no you're, you're on. Okay. Um, it, the, the sound system has improved dramatically since, <laughs> yes, yes. since we were here last. I think the air has too. This yeah. is good. <laughs> People out there and are watching on cable can actually see what's going on and hear us. It's, it's, it's amazing. That is revolutionary, yeah. yes. <laughs> well, we're delighted to have a chance to come and talk to you briefly today about what's going on with the sister cities. And I want to put this in context, uh, especially for the school committee. Uh, I'll ask you a question first. Do any of you know what the three largest economies in the world are today? U.S., China, Japan. Excellent. U.S., China, Japan. Notice Japan. Many people guess Germany is one of the top three. It's not. It's Japan, and of course, China is a rising star. By 2020, the projections are that out of the five top economies in the world, Three will be emerging economies, and only two will be currently developed economies. That would be United States and Japan. We are going to be the only folks left in the top tier by 2020 that are currently top tier economies. So that's an excellent reason to know a lot more about Japan. There's a lot of other wonderful reasons that you'll hear about, uh, but that's a big global perspective that I think is helpful. So as you can see on the slides, um, we over the last nine years have done exchanges, 10-day exchanges, for over 300 students. That's the students coming from Naga Okakio and the students going from Arlington over there. Um, in addition, We've had 20 folks, high school students and teach, Japanese high school students come here and our teachers go there to teach for a year uh, in the school systems. And uh, this is fairly extraordinary, I think, to have people actually go and be completely engaged, in, embedded in the economies for such a long period of time. And that's been successful, a challenge, but successful. So the next few slides are about the trip that the Japanese students just made over here. Um, they come during their Golden Week vacation, which is a major holiday in Japan. It happens to be when the cherry blossoms bloom. Basically the whole country takes vacation and that's when the students come here. So we had five high school students and 16 middle school students, which is the group we normally get, and five teacher chaperones. And uh, the top picture you can see, uh, it's a little blurry, but that's the group at their schools before they left with Justin Barasa. And Justin is an Arlington High School teacher who's been teaching over there for a couple of years now. So he was helping them with their English on the way over. And the bottom two slides are pictures of the shrines in Naga Okakio City this is uh, the welcome. The text is talking about, um, it, it basically shows that as the students arrive, we already hand them a homework assignment at the airport. And it's to give them a chance to address questions in English, give them something to feel comfortable discussing with their host families. One of the questions is, what is your favorite sports team? 
A lot of that is about breaking the ice so that the students become immediately somewhat comfortable in our language. Um, and that's the other pictures show one of, uh, one of the host families greeting some host students. And over on the right, you can see what it looks like at the end of their day. Their day coming over is something like 45 hours because of the length of the flight and the time change. And we keep them up as long as we can. So they can start fresh the next morning at Arlington High School. They spend a full day at Arlington High School. They go to different classes, gym class and music class and English class. They also perform at an assembly. The students come prepared to do fairly professional, almost, uh, dance performances, a pop dance performance and a traditional Japanese dance performance. And this year, the assembly uh, that was held last period, I guess, of the day uh, in Low Auditorium was great. It, very enthusiastic audience. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful event. And the students also make an elementary school visit. And on that day, they um, go to, this year they went to Hardy School. They also chair sort of an assembly over there where they perform. And at the elementary schools, they actually go into the classrooms. They went into the second and third grades, which are Hardy and Thompson classrooms this year. And um, the visiting students teach origami and calligraphy and kendama. And the photos here, um, at the top, you can see Mr. Kuro, Ms. Bodie, and Mr. Pierce singing with the students. And down the bottom picture is Superintendent Bodie and our Japanese um, visitor singing, practicing to sing Sakura together. This is a few more pictures from Hardy. Hardy School actually has a Tori gate built on school grounds, which has been dedicated to the Japanese um, because of some of their problems, the Fukushima explosions and things. Uh, it's also a wonderful place for our Japanese folks to come and mingle with the Americans and talk about some of those things. On the right, you see the students in the classroom and also below, the Japanese students teaching. They also go to the Otteson Middle School. They spend an entire day there. At the middle school, they shadow students. Each individual Japanese visitor shadows an American student um, for the day, so they get a real sense of what it's like to be in the classrooms, which are quite different from their school situations over there. At the end of the day, we have the Cherry Blossom Festival, the Sakura Festival there, and that's the top is the students performing, and the bottom is the uh, Japanese leading the whole audience in a traditional Japanese dance, and as you can see, they're wearing their lovely kimonos. At the end of the visit, uh, we always have a goodbye, a farewell event, and that's pictures from um, the event itself, and at the bottom you can see we always have Japanese students cry. Um, even after the eight days that they're here, they really, really love to come, and they're very grateful for being hosted by families here and welcomed, being welcomed into our community. I wanted to also include um, a look back. This is from the first trip that Arlington took over there with students. And I don't think you can see it too well on this slide, but the top slide is their welcome for us. The bottom is a closer view of what the sign there says. And it actually says, hell to Arlington. <laughs> And I don't in any way mean to make fun of them because, of course, our signs are not in Japanese at all when they come. <laughs> well, we're getting better, actually. We have one or two in Japanese now. But it's just to illustrate the, um, the hurdles there are because this is a very public event. There, where they had 200 townspeople come and all that. And um, you can imagine the kind of errors we make over there, the faux pas we make. And it's really fascinating. It's a great cultural learning experience for anybody, adult or student, to be part of this and to get over some of those hurdles. 
And finally, I really wanted to show you the um, girl, in, young woman in plaid in the middle there. That's Becca Krantz. Her family has been hosting all nine years, and she was a high school student when they first, when we first started the program, and she went to Japan on one of our early visits, went back and stayed with friends she had made there at the time, and in the fall, she is going back for a full year to teach in the Nagao Kakio school systems as an employee there for the year. So um, that, in, I mean, I'm just speechless. Her Japanese is fluent. She's incredibly excited to go. Um, yeah, it's an amazing outcome of the program. I also wanted to say that uh, we have Japanese students coming here for 11th grade, a uh, couple a year, and the one who was here last year, Kaoru Kizu, uh, graduated at the very top of her cl university bound class, uh, even after spending a year here away from her Japanese teachers. So the kids who do this are pretty amazing. And that's a wonderful segue to our student leaders for the July trip going to Naga Okakia this year, Nick Streit and Fiona Mosley, and they would like to say a few words. Hi, I'm Nick Streit, and I'm a freshman at AHS this year. And I just want to say it's a really, really great program. I'm going over to, J to Japan this July, and I'm super, super excited. It's a great experience, and when they come here, you can tell they love to be a part of this experience. They're really grateful for it. They love to experience the American culture. And surprisingly, they actually do pick up English very fast, and you can have conversations with them. And then there's like so many differences in our country or cultures, but they, there's so many similarities too. And one of the best things, I think, is to get them to try American food. And they they really love the American candy and barbecue too, and so that when I go over, I want to try the Japanese food as well. And my dad lived in Japan for a while, and he says the food stalls are great, so I would like to try those. And then also, I have hosted for the past two years, and this is my first trip over to Japan. So I get to see my friends I've made in the past here. And I'm really excited, and I think it's going to be a great, a great thing. And it's a great thing for Arlington ha to have this program. It's a great way to learn and experience different cultures. And I'm going to pass it on to Fiona now. Hello, I'm Fiona Mosley, and I'm also a freshman at AHS. And this is just a great opportunity to immerse yourself in another culture, and it's just very enriching and. I'm very excited to go to Japan and take part in their culture and I also hosted for the past two years and I'm very excited to see my students. Um, my exchange student was actually in this slideshow. She was the one sobbing so <laughs> we've been emailing back and forth for like the past week that she's been back in Japan. We've already planned out what we're going to do together and I'm very grateful for the school committee and the Arlington community for this great opportunity. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd uh, like to just acknowledge the artwork around the room. Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, if I could get you just to raise that over there. Directly to my right, right over here, uh, are pieces from fourth graders. They're called Cereal Box Package Design. Students discussed why packages we purchase make use of special design elements and that such elements are planned by people called graphic designers. Classes were then told they, could, they would be designing a package for a fictitious cereal brand called Big B. They were encouraged to invent mascots, logos, company names. They were required to include pictures and lettering, think about fonts, colors, placement, and visual elements. Uh, moving down the wall, the second part are also from fourth graders. This, uh, group is called Analogous Landscapes. After discussing and exploring the style and techniques of Impressionist painting, they looked at meadow of Giovanni, I hope I pronounced it right, by Claude Monet. They were guided to notice the use of analogous colors, colors next to one another on the color wheel. Students were instructed to uh, fix and modify their colors for their own paintings. On the back wall, 
are from a group of first graders understanding warm and cool colors. Students discussed warm colors, red, yellow, and orange, and cool colors, blue, green, and purple. They saw how Georgia O'Keeffe's Red Hills with flowers used warm colors, and Claude Monet's Water Lilies used the cool colors. Students created their own oil pastel drawings using either warm or cool colors. Then moving just behind us over here on the left, uh, a group of second graders created paper pendants. Students discussed why people wear jewelry. Students learned that different cultures have varying styles and how they have changed over time. Students were instructed to design and create their own pendants from paper and aluminum foil. They also included additional de uh, decorations with markers and pencils. And our last piece right over here directly from my left uh, are from third graders, monochromatic paintings about feelings. Students viewed reproduction of Pablo Picasso's blue period and discussed the similarities. They were quick to notice that blue was the dominant color and that the objects appeared very sad, subjects, excuse me, appeared very sad, lonely, and poor. Students chose something which generated strong feelings for them to depict it in a monochromatic painting in the color which would best communicate their feelings and their ideas. We really appreciate the uh, added color to, it adds to this room. Thank you, Pierce students. At this time, we will go into public participation, and uh, our first person is Alicia Serafini. Fine, Mr. Sunsford. Sunsford, sorry. Good evening, everyone. Um, Alicia and I are here to um, really discuss our role in the, as um, uh, members of the A of the subcommittee. Uh, doesn't roll off the tongue exactly, but it's the, the idea of it is that it would allow Arlington teachers the benefit to have their children attend the Arlington Public Schools. And before I, you know, we went into anything here, I just wanted to give a little background of what has been involved here. Um, this actually came out of a contract agreement from two contracts ago. Um, and it was pretty much postponed into a subcommittee later on in the, in the last contract. Um, and, you know, we've come a long way with this. I mean, it's been two years of meeting. Um, when we started, we were in the depths of a recession, going through some pretty tough contract negotiations. We were dealing with, you know, huge issues such as health care reform, uh, GIC to name a few. And, um, you know, there's obviously sometimes tensions between the two sides. And it's been really nice to be a part of a committee that has really come a long way. Uh, the two sides have really... Uh, work very well together. Um, I really have been, we've really enjoyed working with Rob, Bill, and Leva. It's been a uh, wonderful experience that we've consistently met over these two years, always respected each other, and uh, it certainly has been something I feel like we've made a lot of progress. We've worked very hard, and uh, just want to show our appreciation for people being open to the idea in general at first. So I'll hand it over to Alicia here. Thank you. And again, my name is Alicia Serafini, and I am a visual arts teacher at the Audison Middle School. And I'm here tonight to speak about the benefits of passing a pilot program that would allow, that would allow a small number of teachers to enroll their children in the Arlington Public Schools based on space availability. For the past two years, I've had the opportunity to be a member of the subcommittee that has discussed this topic. The work and conversation surrounding this topic has gone through many phases. In the end, we reached a conclusion that, felt that we felt satisfied both the needs of the teachers and the needs of the Arlington Public Schools. Since having children of my own, I have found opportunities in my town to help out on councils and organizations, but my heart is here and my time is divided, and I want to spend my time with these types of commitments here in Arlington. I would be thrilled if my own child could reap the benefits of the hard work of both myself and the other teachers and all of the members of the Arlington Public Schools. Unfortunately, right now, living in Arlington is not an option for me. With home prices as they are, it is unrealistic to assume that teachers would be able to purchase something here. The implementation of such a program would send a message not only to the families that would be involved, but to all Arlington teachers and to the Arlington community. In 2006, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was offered a job in Brookline. 
I was offered a job that I'd be working four days a week as an art teacher and I would be making more money than I was making here full time. But the decision was simple. I would not leave Arlington. The reason was because of a benefit that was made available to Arlington public school teachers. My three month old daughter would be able to go to the daycare in the same school that I taught in. I'm so thankful to Arlington that I had the opportunity to have my daughter near me. It made me happier, it made me more productive. I felt and still do feel that Arlington had my back and had the backs of my family. This type of benefit is invaluable and will help Arlington, like so many other towns around us, retain great teachers and recruit new ones. The towns that allow this benefit are thriving and well-respected. Currently, there are more than 20 other towns that offer this type of program in the vicinity, towns like Somerville, Melrose, Belmont, and Concord. In all of their contract language regarding this program, there are compromises, as there should be. We have extensively researched their contract language and contacted lawyers about the validity of the language. I'm here tonight to ask you to consider allowing our town to have a pilot program such as this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tassoni. Good evening. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak before you. Um, I'm Pasquale Tassoni, the interim performing arts director and a town resident. Although I'm blissfully past the age where I need to worry about where my children will go to school, I'm here tonight to express and support the sentiments of one of my staff members, Tino D'Agostino, who cannot be here. I believe a program whereby students of APS staff are allowed to attend our schools is beneficial for all students, staff, and the community. I believe it will attract and help retain good young teachers and encourage them to invest in our community. This is especially important given that most of our young teachers cannot afford to live in Arlington. My not having been current as to the status of this initiative has allowed me in the last day or so to play devil's advocate by asking many questions which I am sure have been asked, answered, and discussed by teachers as well as school committee. Chief among these are, what is the cost to the town? If approved, will this program be permanent? Have issues of space been addressed? The answers I have heard reassure me that all the precautions the Arlington schools need have been put in place. Those of us who have been here many years realize that Arlington can be a wonderfully rewarding place to live and teach. A program such as this will make it even more so. As an administrator, I strongly believe that investing in the happiness and well-being of my staff has always paid me huge dividends. That is why I urge the administration and school committee to rally behind this pilot program. We can assess it at the end of the first year. In closing, I would like to remind everyone that there is a past precedent for this program in Arlington. Although it was probably not an official program, in my, if my memory serves me correctly, in the mid-90s, there was at least one teacher at the high school, a Belmont resident, whose child attended Arlington High School. I do not know when or why the program was discontinued. Again, thank you for your time, and I once again urge you to support this initiative. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, at this time, that ends the public participation. Uh, Mr. Schlickman, do you have a motion that you want to uh, put forward at this time? Okay, I, I would uh, move to <clears throat> table the di uh, discussion on enrollment of out of district uh, children uh, of teachers in the Arlington Public Schools uh, so we can take it up after Mr. Pierce arrives. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion at this time regarding that? All those in favor, favor of tabling uh, the discussion on the enrollment of uh, district, out of district students, say aye. 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 All those opposed? It is passed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At this time, I would like to recognize uh, Shannon Riley, our student representative. She's a senior at Arlington High School. She's a member of the Student Council. Uh, National Honor Society and Ice Hockey. Thank you for coming. Uh, you have a right to participate in any of the discussions. Uh, at this time, I would uh, turn it over to Dr. Bodie to, uh, for the purpose of discussing for uh, first reading of the district goals. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. This has been the process that we are in. It, it, for the people listening this evening, um, is an earlier process than we have engaged in in past years. Um, 
our motivation for moving this to an earlier time in the in the year, in fact, before next year, um, is motivated by the new educator evaluation system, which will uh, be necessary for teachers, administrators alike, to develop goals which are aligned not only with their district goals, but their school improvement goals. And since there is a through line from district to school improvement, we need to move forward with um, the development of our district goals in order for the school councils at the, all of the schools to be able to begin, begin their work and complete it by the middle of, July, uh, middle of June. So that's just a little bit of background why uh, this discussion is occurring now rather than in the fall, which has been past practice. The development of these goals has actually been taking place over the last couple of months. Um, actually, beginning, beginning of this year, truly, because the school committee worked uh, very hard to develop overarching strategic goals uh, for the Arlington Public Schools, and with the idea that every year there would be action uh, and specific action, specific goals to further those strategic goals. As we come into this next year, there are a number of major initiatives that the school system is, is going to be uh, addressing. First among them is the ed new educator evaluation system. Um, we have been in preparation of that all year, and we can talk more about that at an upcoming meeting, though you've already had some, um, some uh, discussion of that at the table before now. We also have um, the retail um, courses that, and professional development that needs to be um, implemented next year for approximately 60 of our teachers. We continue to want to narrow the achievement gap of our students in different subgroups, and that remains um, an active goal as we move forward in the years ahead. We also have a number of other um, goals which I want to speak to tonight. So as we, we've already begun this process, and the last time we met, we had a retreat to, to start wordsmithing these, talking about what you would like to see in terms of pr perspective and expressing the goals as well as, as well as goals. So I present to you tonight um, the, the draft four of the uh, district goals as a first read this evening. And um, look forward to your comments. Uh, I think one of the things that was addressed in these had to do with how you put the goals in terms of the perspective of either the students or the teacher in the wording of the goals. The essence of the goals haven't changed in, in goal one, but certainly the wording has been modified. Uh, um, as we there has been some addition to the goals from the, t the time that we met in the retreat. And one of them I had said we were going to develop, which was our, our work around the special education initiative next year in how we're restructuring um, delivery of services in the elementary school. So that's expressed in goal three, um, number three. And then in addition to that, if in goal four, um, I've also included a goal um, relative to the Stratton School. We, we want to keep front and center the, the, the focus on moving forward with developing um, a, an equity plan so that the Stratton Elementary's physical condition is, is uh, comparable to our other elementary schools. And, and while it's not specifically the school committee goal, it is something that we're moving forward with, with the, in partnership with the Capital Planning Committee, which will be an engaging in a study next year of the, uh, the needs of Stratton in order for it to become, as I said, equitable to the other elementary schools. So, those, so the special education goal and the Stratton goal are new additions from our retreat. Um, but otherwise, the goals remain virtually the same, but just with a, with a different um, uh, wording of them. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about these. Okay. Uh, let 
Does that, any of the members have questions for Dr. Bodhi regarding this? Dr. Ampey? Um, so unfortunately, I was, unable, I was ill and unable to attend the first retreat, so I don't know if there's backstory to what I'm going to bring up, but because of that, I kind of went through and was reviewing myself what the SMART goals stand for, because I couldn't remember very well. And I looked at what the DESE about that the S is for specific and strategic, M is measurable, A is action-oriented, R is rigorous, realistic, and results, and T is timed and tracked. And when I look at what we have compared to those um, items, to me it seems like a lot of the goals are miss missing a measurement, an action, results, and tracking. And I just don't, was there a discussion that that's going to be in a different level, or I just, I'm confused. Okay. okay. Do you want to respond? I, I would actually, though, I don't know, Libo, did you want to say I was, something? I was going to also speak to um, the question. Um, we actually did spend a, quite a, a bit of time talking about the language of the goal and then the indicators that go along with each goal. And we did recrafting of the goals to make sure that there was something specific and measurable in the goal. And then the, um, the indicators and I'm forgetting the correct word, was it objects, objectives associated with the goals, then have the specific measurable steps that you're going to be looking at to achieve that goal. So there is that level of breakdown, but it's not included in the actual overarching goal. Okay, so this is not everything. Correct. It's not everything. Okay. In fact, um, the Department of Education has um, evolved in how they, they suggest writing goals. Um, we have a general statement of a goal, and in fact, the one that I g had given the, the committee for the pilot sort of dis demonstrates that, where there's the goal, which meets a lot of the criteria you were talking about, but then there are actions that you take specific to in actualizing that goal, and then what are the benchmarks or the evidence that you've actually achieved it? And in past years, we've we've, uh, and in fact, the committee likes this form format a lot. Um, we've put our goals into two different formats. One is this, which is just basically the goals we've um, we publish. But then there's another, um, more of a chart form where we have the goal, the actions associated with that goal, and what the evidence. And then the last column is comments on, on completion. So I, ex I fully expect to take all of these and put them into that kind of format. But right now, what these, what these goals give the school councils and teachers as they think forward to next year, sort of the framework the, uh, that we're, the direction that we're going in next year. What are the most important things that we want to emphasize? Okay, so so that I'm sorry. So go right ahead. <laughs> um, so that helps. I just wonder about the specificity and and you know when because there's differences in saying we're going to increase by fifty percent and if we really felt like we could do that for something, that'd be great versus 0.5 percent and. Um, so what did you folks decide? I mean, are we just approving this and then we'll see what else rolls out from it? Well, at this, this is a first reading. So if, if any one of us had, are looking for something to change or get more information on, this is the time to, to seek it. <coughs> Go right ahead. Um, I believe, though, that this would be um, an easier document to approve if we had the action document. Mm -hmm next to it so there was that um, breakdown for what is actually included in each area because then there's that clarity around what the specific indicators are. Are, are you asking Dr. Bodhi I'm, to provide I, that I'm for the second Dr. reading? I'm asking Dr. Bodhi to provide to that. that for the second reading so that we can have that document to further define the, the goals. Is that the consensus of the group? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's yeah. great. Mr. Thielman? Okay, so tonight, this is a first reading, mm -hmm. and then next week is good. So my, <clears throat> we have uh, one-third of 
teachers who have been identified by the department, elementary and secondary education is requiring uh, SCI endorsement will take the retail course during the 2013-14 school year. I'm presuming the outcome is gonna be they're gonna be better able to teach e ELL students. That's so, correct. So is there any way to include somewhere in there <coughs> something about the Im improved instruction for ELL students? Sure. I mean, I think that <clears throat> the goal of just taking the course I mean, they're taking the course. We can, I think we can come up with a better, you know, some, something's gotta be different for the, for the kids. Something's gotta be different for ELL students mm -hmm. as a result of their taking this course. They're, 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 they're better. Mm -hmm. Do we have, and okay, so my follow-up is, we have data on ELL students. I'm sorry, we have? We have data on ELL students. Oh, yes. So may, I don't know how specific you can get, but something that suggests improvement in learning, I don't know. I don't know, I don't have anything at my fingertips to. Actually, our, our ELL students do very well on the, the assessments. What are we taking the course for? <laughs> it's required. It's it's required. So just do it because it's required? Okay. Yes. It's required, but it's also part of our um, corrective action plan. Uh, um, we, as you recall, we, we just, just because of the number of staff that we have and the number of students that are growing, we have some students that are at a level one or level two are not getting the exact number of hours of instruction every, every week. And our corrective <coughs> action plan was to create more uh, sheltered immersion classrooms so that in some ways that, that might be an improved way of doing it so they're not having a pull out model all the time. So the, this initiative by the state actually um, overlaps quite well with what we want to do as a district. And we had that discussion in terms of, um, you know, who would be the first to go. We actually have about uh, close to 300, maybe 280 teachers that will need to have taken this course. It's a 45-hour 45, 45 graduate course in the next three years. This will have financial implications for the district in FY 15 and 16 because the state's only going to pay for 180 of them. So, so maybe an outcome could be something to the, to the effect of, uh, and I'm just wordsmithing off the top of my head, to the effect I, of, mm -hmm. yeah. That, I know what you're trying to, yeah. in, 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 what, is, what is going to be the effect on students yeah. as a result of this? So that, that no. but, but you also want, we, we, can, we can create, um, a baseline of this year. Now the tests just change. The assessments just change. You want no, to yeah, the, the assessment uh, recently changed from uh, MEPA and MELO to yeah. the access test. So we're just and, and there is the state is going to give us something to supposedly allow us to translate and look at last year's results under the MEPA MELO to the access for this year, which the results will be out shortly. But the other thing is that most teachers will not finish the some teachers will finish the course halfway through the year and the other group of teachers will finish no. the course at the end of the year. No. So to set a goal for next year that we're going to see an increase in scores based on a course that teachers are just taking and just learning how to implement in the classroom I think is quite aggressive. Well, would it, yeah, I think you're right. Could it be, could it, you know, wordsmithing in the air is always dangerous, but would it, would, could it be something to the effect of um, as we plan FY15, the number of pullouts will be reduced, or the number of the number of well, in actuality, that will be that will. That's be okay. Then that's an outcome that the number of students will be fully integrated into into the classroom will increase, will increase. for FY15. That's, that's so true. that's that's a direct outcome yes, of this project. That yes. is correct. You get to the spring of 2014. Yes. yes. We're doing our planning for 2015. Yep. More kids are are, are, are integrated yes. fully into the. That classroom. would be. Uh, I would be very comfortable with that's that. That's actually a. a Good outcome of that. Yes. That's I'll work that into the language yeah, of it. So That's let, good. Let's just let's, let's. Do you have something in. you want to add to it, or I want to give other people a first chance? No, Leva was tapping me. You okay? I was, you, I was tapping just because um, I want to point out the two items Mr. Thielman asked for are already included in different goal areas, mm -hmm. and our our discussion did talk about how because these goals were so overarching, they did implement in different ways. So we do have an achievement gap subgroup filled in already, which um, ELL students are a subgroup that we looked at and we did see gaps in last year at specific grade levels in terms of their achievement from the presentation um, Ms. Brusezzi did. And then the other piece is under goal three, number three, um, you have the integration of general ed and special ed 
um, support team and you talk about the push-in mm -hmm. models, and that also um, somewhat speaks to the ELL delivery model. So perhaps parts of that are already there because of the specificity. Is that what you see? Is that how you see it? Well, I, I, I see uh, definitely the goal one, um, number two, as being uh, what Ms. Heinemann is saying. Um, I would say that goal three, number three, is similar to what we want to write for ELL students. That's That deals specifically with special education, but yeah. it would be along the same line. <coughs> because and I think what's missing, would, yeah. And, the, and I think that we could, I could sit with um, Carla Borsese, who is the director of ELL, and we could come up with a reduction in pullouts. Yeah, so I think that's, that's the Because that's, definitely, that's yes. definitely our goal. Good. Well said mm -hmm. on that one. Good. Yep. Mr. Schlickman, do you have anything? Yeah, um, I, I will say, first of all, that uh, uh, I'm impressed by the school system, and I think we do a lot of wonderful things, and we do very well, and in fact, extraordinary things in many areas. Uh, that said, there are a couple of places where we have some weaknesses that we've needed to address, and we talked about them last year. Uh, I would feel more comfortable going through the goal, district goal process uh, if I had the results of last year's goals in front of me so that we could use that as a benchmark, but unfortunately several of those goals are MCAS based and accountability measure based and we won't have that data till September and so here we are in May trying to feel our way forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the new state uh, evaluation system is sort of putting us in this box. But the two areas that, that I have concern for, and, and I expressed last year, one is the gap in achievement between uh, <coughs> high needs and in our general population, and that mm -hmm. has exposed itself in a couple of key places uh, in, in the new accountability system last year. Um, so in, in a parallel, our annual measurable achievement objectives for 2012, we didn't hit them on the PPI for, second, uh, for um, limited English proficient English language learners. Um, the other thing that has been a persistent area for basically as long as I've been on the committee is uh, student achievement uh, coming into, into the Odyssey and the growth numbers have been low and persistently low in grade six. And so in terms of looking at measures of, uh, of progress and of meeting goals, that when we wrote goal one last year, we put in two very specific <coughs> provisions of the annual PPI, not the cumulative, so we don't get weight, weight, weight schools down under past performance. Mm -hmm but an annual PPI of 75, which is meeting the target within the school, which is necessary for a school to achieve level one status. And uh, for growth scores of 51 or greater, which is the PPI, uh, which is the target goal for, for the PPI measure. Uh, and most schools in most places are meeting that and doing just fine, but there are a couple of areas and a couple of places where we've fallen short and maybe even consistently fallen short. Uh, and I would really prefer to see those specific numbers uh, staying within the, uh, the goals moving forward until we've actually evidenced uh, meeting them. And, and I take it a little different view of this than most people. Uh, because I work with this on a regular basis. I don't want easy goals that we're going to all achieve and celebrate because that's not really much of a celebration. I would much rather be in a position where I have an ambitious goal that we may not make and possibly won't make but can demonstrate real and meaningful progress towards and, and that would be cause for significant <coughs> celebration. Uh, the an accountability measure, an accountability system is not a punishment tool and it is not designed to uh, call people out when we fall short, but I think that it's really urgent for us to set high standards uh, and uh, to bring the entire system to where uh, we know it can and should be. Uh, this is a level one district. Uh, there's such great teachers, there's such great things happening. Um, the 
numbers may not always reflect that, but I think that uh, preserving the old language in Goal 2, to me, just feels important. In Goal 1, Item 2, it just, it just feels important to me. It really mm -hmm. does, because I, wa I, wa I want those high standards, and I want that sense of urgency surrounding uh, our high-needs sure. kids and moving uh, the sixth grade, the Odyssey. I'll ask again, is that consensus with, from the rest of the committee members on that as well? Okay. <coughs> Ms. Starks. Um, I just, I, and I don't need to read all these, but I, I kind of wordsmith. Under Gold two. I was just um, listening to the discussions that we were having last week around these. Um, I changed them all to teachers will, teachers will, mm -hmm. kindergarten students will, um, and I can just give you those. I don't need to read them. But, you know, I was trying to, along the same lines as, you know, what you've been hearing is just, I have nothing, mm -hmm. the goals themselves are great, but it was just kind of a, you know, they will do this by doing that, you know, is kind of the, so I can just give you those, and that's not a big deal. But I think overall they're great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, actually attempted that with the administrative team, and I sent my email to all of you the other night, um, the, uh, a good example of that is number three in goal one. Mm -hmm. Try the language of students will monitor their own progress, but the truth of the matter is it's, while that may happen in some of the upper grades, we're pointing out that really in first grade, second grade, that's not going to be the reality. What, what we really want to have these district determined measures for is for teachers to be able to monitor mm -hmm. student progress. So. We've been, we, by doing that, at least in that particular goal, we lost the intent of what we were trying to achieve. But I'm open to any additional wordsmithing to get to get at this. So right. give me your, yeah, I'll give I'll it a sure whirl. Yeah, we'll make sure you have them at the end. Okay. Is there any, anyone else that would like to add anything at this time? Um, I have two things, actually. Must be that so, seat. Mm -hmm. I think it is the seat. Um, <laughs> Goal three, three, sub, sub part three, um, the one about special education. I don't understand, as Mr. Thielman was saying, um, how does that relate to students? How does that relate to what students will be experiencing? I, I'm, I see it's listing a whole bunch of different things that I know the special education department is planning, but I just, I don't see that it pulls it together and explains why or how, or what's, you know, what's the benefit of this. And I don't have a suggestion for where, you know, for a new wording. I just couldn't wrap my head around really what's the aim here. If I may, just for clarity, you're looking for a connection for the student gain? <clears throat> I'm saying that I don't understand how it's relating to student achievement, mm -hmm. to any issues in student achievement, or, or to any issues students are experiencing. I, I don't see that, that tie-in, and I think it would be helped by that. Okay, so that was thing one. And then thing two is um, going off on a totally different note, uh, and, but it's actually my biggest concern looking at this. And my concern is that we have yet to address any long range financial planning. And I feel this is important because when we have teachers or department heads come to us with new programs such as the foreign language initiative we don't know how much money we have this year or next year or the year after to supply this program or not um, we don't know what monies we have available going into the future for technology replacement um, and i just We've discussed this before. Mr. Thielman had, had made a suggestion of doing something where we projected how many more teachers we have. 
or how many more teachers we can add to something. We saw a little bit of that, but it hasn't been followed up and it kind of never really got fleshed out. And I'm just concerned that this is a, <coughs> the schools are a multi-million dollar enterprise, tens of millions of dollars. And we need to know where, what we're thinking in the future. And my understanding is that if we want something done next year, this is the place we need to be doing it. I understand I'm one person on the committee, but it's something I felt very strongly about for a long time, and I'm bringing it up again because I still don't see it in the goals. I don't have a suggestion for the language yet because I, some of it is what do people, you know, what do people think? Do we want a three-year look? Do we want a five-year look? Um, do we just want kind of general numbers? Or maybe nobody else thinks this, but it, it's, I, it's something I think we really need. And it would change my decision-making on things, potentially. Anyone wish to add to that? I, I would just say that I think everyone should this is a first reading and it's a kind of not a traditional first reading in the sense of a policy and mm -hmm. that was put forward by the committee but it's something put forward by the superintendent so i think if people have specific success suggestions for uh, the team just send an email to kathy with all the ideas you want to have. so i mean I, so, so i think if so i think that's all i think you just write whatever you think should be in there and send it so it's we don't i don't think we're, we're not making a proposal that we have to kind of right amend we're making suggest we're having a conversation we're giving the superintendent some ideas we can follow up with specifics and there could be a lot of back and forth between committee members and the superintendent until next week or two weeks okay following the precedent of the former chairs i will if everyone's had this i i'll give i would agree with the the last speaker uh mm -hmm. dr ampey uh i think it's important to have that information and the other things that were said the other documents uh, to make it a clear picture uh, of the things. So, anything else at this time? Can I? Can I? Sure. Go ahead. Well, it's a great point, and but um, I'm not sure the direction you want to go with it. And maybe you can send me some language because where we are as a district is that we are next year. FY14 will be the third year of the plan that we agreed to. When, when we the override was passed and we have we have had fidelity to that plan and in in doing so this committee's had discussions about trade-offs and in increasing the budget the town appropriation part by 3.5 percent and special ed by seven percent we and you, and you factor into that collective bargaining agreements, which, by the way, we'll be entering into another um, uh, contract in another year. Though there's a lot of uncertainty as to what the next agreement will be. Will we continue the agreement we currently have? I know that's going to be a discussion with the Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, we're going to be entering into contract negotiations with all of our unions in another year. Um, but we have... Ha we have we have had fidelities, I said, to the plan that we, we promised to the voters in Arlington. And as you know only too well, there has been additional reserves that have been able to be um, uh, saved in order to potentially continue the plan uh, beyond the three years. In fact, the selectmen talk about anywhere from three to, uh, to f this plan going on for five to seven years. So if we were to assume that that was going to continue, and we made some assumptions around uh, collective bargaining. What we are going to be working in, in terms of the direction of this district, is making decisions um, within that framework. So I'm, I'm not sure what you would like to have for a, a goal around this. Is it, is, it a, a, is it a planning goal? Is it a goal to work with town officials and, and, and the Long Range Planning Committee on this? Is it to cr give you some financial models? I I'm, I'm not really sure when I say, when I hear about financial planning, what you have in mind. It's a planning goal, and potentially with 
perhaps one or two models, you know, you make assumptions about if, if contracts are able to be settled at one level, if contracts are, are settled at a different level, this is where we go. You make assumption, we assume that the same revenues continue um, and just look if, if we, and we make assumptions about growth and how many teachers we need to address the, that growth. And if we're partly, we're just trying to see, are we going positive or are we gonna be running out of money and when are we running out of money? It, it's just, it, it's like the long range financial plans, but for the school. Um, that's so you would like to have a, a planning goal about uh, pr providing the committee with some scenarios? Yes. That's what you want. Oh, yes. all right. There's one other thing, and I will admit to my ignorance in finances and stuff, but right now we're dependent on the town to basically upfront money for the kindergarten each year, and part of that agreement was that they would get the difference back on the Chapter 70. I'm simplifying it. I would hope if we haven't been, we need to start doing it, setting money aside so we can become independent of the town so that, that we eventually might be able to gain the whole aspect of that Chapter 70. We, we borrow the money every year. Can, Go can ahead. Address, we, we don't borrow the money. The all year. the money comes into a big pot, and then it's all mushed together and it loses any semblance of being Chapter 70 okay, or not. Okay, but the first year, we did not have the $970,000 to up, up front the full-time kindergarten. So mm -hmm. whatever words we want. They increased, our, they increased our appropriation. So they gave us the money. They increased our appropriation by the $970,000 to offset then, the kindergarten fees. Let me ask this question. Are we in this hole? What hole? Of they get the difference every year from now on? The way the multi-year plan works is that if state revenues fluctuate, it has no impact on the amount of funds that flow through to us. But my understanding was that if they gave us that money, whatever difference came back as a result of the, our increased Chapter 70 by having full-time students, they would get. I, I think you're thinking about it too divisively you know the amount of money that, st that comes to the state to, from the state to the town goes into a pot as I Dr. Just, Allison Ampey said we didn't ask for a loan we simply told okay, them I that just, if we could be made whole with the nine hundred seventy thousand dollars that we as a community stood to improve our situation by eliminating fees and by potentially increasing our revenues from the state down the road effectively passing the costs of the kindergarten fees back to the state there was no deal about any differential. Okay. Well, I understand that, but as a result of having these children 100%, our Chapter 70 went up beyond the costs of the full-time kindergarten, mm -hmm. almost double. But there were other issue. factors that increased Chapter 70 in addition to the full-time kindergarten. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that I would like us to get that extra piece of the pie somewhere down <coughs> the line. That's all. Mr. Thielman. Now I'm catching up to what Chrissy's, I think I am. Do we have a long, do we have a, a multi-year plan? Like a town has a multi-year plan? Not it, separate from the town. Have, have, you, have you thought about doing that? Sure. What's the hesitation to do that? It's not a hesitation, it's simply a, you know, time on task. Okay, time on, okay. So that's yeah, the, no, I think it's a great idea. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. Okay. So we like, that, that's a good goal. That's yeah, the goal. That, right. that's now I'm there catching up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's my email to the superintendent. Put that in there, so that's good. Here's a goal. So what, what's, a, what's, a, what's, what's a good plan? Three, five years? I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I'm not well, but, you know, that's something that I think that should probably be referred to the budget subcommittee, and we should talk about what the parameters are. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't run too many scenarios, and that's, you know, when all of our multi-year plannings for the town, that's what we sit there and talk about, what scenarios are in and what scenarios are out. But as a baseline, we're going to have to decide and I think budget subcommittee is the place for what are the scenarios that we want to play out that seem the most reasonable, and then down the after we get a base plan, start fiddling with this variable or that variable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm I think this is something for budget subcommittee to uh, then, to to give me so the guidance the, okay. on what okay. scenarios. Okay. So the goal is to develop a, a multi-year plan for the Ellington Public Schools. Multi a multi-year fiscal and financial. Uh, 
Yeah, financial long-range plan. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, multi-year financial plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it so one be, sec. It'll be different from the town. Yeah, yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's going to be quite different yeah, in some respects, but we, we, we definitely, that. I mean, we have to narrow down the number. I think the first step for me to get my brain around it, we need to narrow down. We have to decide on a set of assumptions is going to be some kind of baseline to start and then start playing with the assumptions. Okay. The baseline is the current, our current situation. I mean, this is the, so nothing changes. Yeah, that you, we continue. You, the that first we, plan you do is nothing changes, mm -hmm. and the then that's contract the first increases plan. are the same, yeah, revenues the same. are the same. Yeah. The first flat, flat, flat. The okay. first, the first plan, everything is the same. That's easy enough to do. Sure. Mm -hmm. The scenarios become, you know, a conversation. I don't know if you want the budget subcommittee but, involved, but you guys can figure okay. out the scenarios. We're getting a little far. Yeah. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, I, I, I hear the conversation, and I'm trying to frame it in a way that sort of makes intuitive sense for everybody at the table and my thinking is is that given the tight finances uh, that we face on an annual basis albeit better than we were facing when I was on the committee in, in the previous decade um, we're making budget decisions annually so that when we prepare the fiscal 15 budget over the course of the next school committee year uh, if we're adding something or deleting something or making some change to the budget, uh, the, the question that's hanging over our head is sustainability. Is this something, if we add something next year, is that something we're going to be able to maintain? Uh, or is that going to come and whack us in two or three years? And I think that, that that's the sense of unease that school committee members have because it gets very painful to cut things once you've established them and there's something of a reluctance to go and be aggressive in, in terms of instituting something that's important without having some faith that we're not just going to get uh, uh, faced with uh, eliminating it or cutting it uh, drastically in a subsequent year. So I think that that's sort of the flavor of the desire to have some sort of a projection that we could use as a baseline to measure things as we're adding and subtracting from the budget next year. I still would like to have the, the um, input of the budget subcommittee because, you know, in order to play with the variables in different scenarios, mm -hmm. we have to decide what are the breakout variables. You know, and I, just sitting here right now thinking the obvious breakout variables are the different collective bargaining units, mm -hmm. uh, special ed out-of-district costs, transportation costs, other special ed costs, um, and um, technology, because that's the question that's sort of hanging over everybody's heads. There may be other factors. I mean, those are the ones that just immediately occur to me. There may be other factors that we want to play with variables on as well, and that's where I'd like the input. Oh, yeah, you shouldn't have to do this alone. The, the, we, we need to be partners in that conversation in, in developing that. Okay. You comfortable with that as I chair of the budget? I got it down. Thank you. <laughs> we all set on that one? We'll need a meeting. We we didn't answer your question, actually, which was that the money, you think the money should... I, I will wait, You'll wait. Okay. to look to the scenarios. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to the monthly financial report, Ms. Johnson. Um, given uh, we do have um, departments were asked to have all of their purchasing in by the um, 12th of April and we were able to process them in time for these monthly reports. There are still the usual little dribs and drabs of things that, oh, whoops, I forgot to order paper and things like that. But um, for the most part, um, I think we have a pretty good picture of expenditures. I met with Mark Miano, the facilities manager, to go over what he thinks the likely costs will be between now and the close of the year. Given many factors, um, there is not going to be any, anywhere near the kind of year-end savings. In fact, there's not going to be much in the way of year-end savings. You know, we will be able to buy a few things based on the way things shake out over the next month, but it's not, it's not like it was the year before. Last year, we had extraordinarily light winter. We had no snow whatsoever, and neither of those things were true this year. Any questions? Um, I appreciate that you gave us the list, the last page, which is the revolving revenues. Um, that's nice to see. I'm just wondering what the balances were at the start of the year for the account. So what's the total balance in these accounts? I don't have that information off the top of my head. Okay. So there is money 
in addition to this. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I have uh, just one thing. It, when you talk about extra money, uh, when we had our list on the for the budget and stuff like that. Will you be looking at that? What we didn't fund, for, if there's any money left? Certainly. And, and going from there first? Certainly. I didn't know if there was anything else pending that required. Great. Thank you. Well said. Okay. Uh, update on Thompson. All right. Um, Karen? The Thompson School Building Committee met um, this week. I don't, uh, our owner's project manager uh, did not have uh, the new updated uh, schedule, but we probably will have that next week and I will give you a copy. But I thought what you would like to see, and it's actually, for those of you that, that did not see these pictures and certainly for people who are watching, some of the pictures of where we are now. And, and uh, from what we have been told, the, the last month in a project like this it starts really just going very quickly. One of the discussions that was going on at the uh, meeting was plantings and <coughs> grass. And so that's, uh, that's um, all right. I'm just going to run through some of these pictures, and I want to thank Karen for uh, doing this because she had to do some work to get it off of. Um, a, a different format. So you get the, cur so the curbing is starting, and you, you can get those are the uh, light poles that have now been put in. Um, you can start to see the flooring. Uh, and, and we had talked about before how colorful the flooring is going to be in the new school. And I think you can start to get a, a sense of that. And then you can see a little bit in the slide on the left what the tiles are like um, on the, uh, the hallways. Excuse me, could I just, the flooring in the classroom, are they spongy or are they just uh, no, like a, a regular tile? They're a, regu they're a regular tile um, that, ca the advantage of these tiles rather than a, anything but a tile is that you can obviously pick up the, the ones that have been damaged and replace them. And we have an attic supply Great. You're starting to see a little bit more definition in the uh, the front foyer. And here you can see um, again the some of the colors that have been painted, the, the the trim of purple, and you see the bright green, and then the the tiling. It is going to be a very colorful school. Um, so you're, you can see the classroom wing. One of the big changes that will happen toward the very end is there is a, a, sun, a, a sun shield, a sun shade is what they call it, that will be a, will be a horizontal shade that, that is, goes both stories, and that won't be put on until the very end. So it's one of those, it's, while it's very functional, it's also going to be quite an architectural detail, which I think is really going to pull the school together. Uh, this is the gym, gymnasium ceiling, and it's just been painted. The last time some of, some of us were in there, it wasn't uh, like this at all. So we've got some of the rooftop uh, mechanical equipment, and I think pretty much, in fact, I know all of the major equipment has now been delivered. And, and have, if it's not been entirely installed, it's, it's um, in progress. The pumps. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly what's usually on your tour. <laughs> All right. Um, and then you have an approach, an approach slab out of a classroom door because we're going to have classrooms on the first floor that can open out um, from the classroom. And uh, obviously, they need to move out onto something other than, than grass. So we have we're starting to get the kitchen formulated with the topping slab. I know it is. You probably, some of you are thinking that we're only what 
two months away, but but we've been told that this is when it starts really changing it's drastically by day by day. All right, so you've got the uh, curtain wall, which is a, 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 a curtain wall is a glass wall. And we, ha we were so glad we were able, when we were budgeting this project out, to, um, to get this case casement work. It really makes a big difference in the mm -hmm. classrooms to have this shelving, but it was uh, one of the last add-ons we did. All right, you start to get a sense of the colors in the room. The, uh, it's only one wall in each of the classrooms that's going to be brightly colored, uh, painted. The other walls will be a, a neutral. Okay, so more of the mechanicals. And uh, this is the, the, the imported boulders. <laughs> the imported boulders. <laughs> imported boulders for the kindergarten outdoor classrooms, yes. Yes. How far did they import them from? I don't, I don't know <laughs> the answer to that. So you get the drinking fountains. And again, you get a sense of what the tiling was going to look like in the hallways. Yeah. And there we have it. Awesome. Yes. Sure. So it's maybe we'll have one. even from when we saw it a couple weeks ago. Um, Mr. Hainer, yes. Siobhan Fuller. Yes, Siobhan. I just want to add that I just drove by there today, and the trees have, they've started putting the trees in, which oh. is really exciting. Wow. So. And I understand there's going to be classroom gardens as well? Yes. There's going to be a, well, not a classroom, but a grade. Every grade is going to have a garden that they, they have. It'll be a raised bed. Competing self proto each year, huh? Like that. Was, question any, is, will they eat what's from the garden? <laughs> <laughs> any questions or anything for anybody? Great. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Uh, superintendent's report. Um, I'm, you, you saw the press release uh, this week. I am very pleased to announce that Kristen DeFrancisco, who is a fifth grade teacher at Hardy, but she has had other experiences be besides that teaching assignment, will be the, has been appointed to, as the new principal at Hardy for next year. As you all know, Deb D'Amico will be retiring at the end of June. Um, so I know that this has been met with a lot of excitement and happiness at Hardy, uh, both uh, from teachers and parents alike. It was a long process, and I want to thank Rob. He did yeoman's work this year in, in really making sure all these, um, these searches were went on time. We, it was a very inclusive process. We had a number of good candidates, um, and it was a... It was a it was a great process. I think the only thing that we've talked about is how can we even make it tighter next year. Uh, sometimes that becomes a challenge when you you have a school vacation in front of you. So uh, I think you know some lessons we learned this year, which we'll have to implement next year as we um, move forward. At least we know with a, a Dallin search, and we'll have to do another director of special education search next year. But uh, we're we're very pleased, and uh, there'll be some opportunities we go over the next month to, to have those transitions. Dr. Bode, can I say something? Sure. Also, in relating to that, I want to commend the search committee for the Hardy. And in addition to the search committee, the, uh, the, the parents and teachers who were not on the search committee all had a chance to meet the finalists. And there was very active participation in, among the parent community and the teachers at the school who obviously have a very strong interest in who the, nec who the next principal would be. Um, I want to commend, I'm, I'm sorry uh, Dr. Tassoni was not here because I wanted to commend him and the members of the Performing Arts Department. They had a spectacular Pops concert this last weekend. Um, truly one of their finest. It was, it, it was spellbinding and, and, and it's, it's, it's due to certainly the, the talent of our students, but that talent has been harnessed in a very, uh, a very professional and high, with very high levels of expectation about how they perform. 
I would say that anyone who listened to any of our high school um, orchestras, jazz bands, concert bands would be very impressed. And I will also say that the orchestra, the Odyssey Orchestra performed at the Cherry Blossom and they did a fantastic job. It was very well done. So congratulations to all of them. And, and I know that May is probably one of the busiest times of the year other than maybe September, but I encourage anybody to try to, see, to hear the pops. Though I was, somebody today I was meeting with said that one of the issues is being able to get a ticket. It's so popular and you know, the, all, the whole balcony is, is filled. So maybe someday we can persuade them to do an extra, an extra evening. Um, the, my April newsletter is out and uh, <coughs> sent to all of you. It's, uh, for those of you that are watching, it's on the website. It was sent to all parents um, and everyone in the district. But I think one of, the, one of the great things as this is evolving, and I, and I do have support and people helping me get the re research some of, the, uh, some of these um, events and projects and awards that, that we talk about, is that it gives the community an insight into what's going on in the schools, which I think that it's hard to get when you're, you don't have children in the school. And even when you have children in the school, you, you're, focus, you're focused on your own child's school and may not see the bigger picture. So we'll continue these, and um, they seem to keep growing as the working on the list today for May, and the list is long. So um, I want to thank uh, Debbie Bodos and Julie Dunn and... Um, uh, for their for their help in, in putting this together with me. This week we had some bus challenges and I want to, uh, mainly because we've had a number of our buses that have been in the shop. And um, generally we have some kind of a spare bus to be able to cover us in these kinds of emergencies, but we, for the first time in a long time, we did not have that early part of this week. And I just want to thank Fidelity House for helping us out. Uh, for a couple days uh, because it was absolutely um, godsend. This, um, this past week, uh, we, ha we hosted a diversity coffee and thank you to the three members of the school committee that came to, the, to this coffee, which is our outreach attempt to, uh, for, um, to attract people from diverse backgrounds to consider applying for positions here in Arlington. Um, Rob, I'll let you talk a little bit about this if you want, because you, you were working very closely with the diversity committee on actually structuring this coffee, and also um, the outreach that we did for the coffee, as well as the job fair we had here at, at the school. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we, uh, I attended several job fairs this, uh, the, during the past few months at various uh, colleges. We also hosted a job fair, fair here at Arlington High School. Um, we, as uh, the building hosted the fair, it was actually sponsored by the Massachusetts Partnership for Diversity in Education, of which we are a member, of which there are several school districts um, in the region who are a member, and, and those districts attended, and uh, candidates from diverse backgrounds were able to come to that job fair and meet uh, representatives from uh, many different school districts. Uh, and pr give their resumes and uh, f about a week after that job fair we hosted this coffee we had done outreach already prior to the job fair uh, reaching out to people who had, who had um, attended previous coffees in, in last year and other candidates that I've met at other job fairs um, from diverse backgrounds and uh, sent email invitations some of the members of the superintendent's uh, diversity advisory committee made phone calls to the candidates there was outreach by that by the members of the committee uh, to uh, to various uh, communities uh, to invite people, and we had a very good turnout at the coffee. Um, and we also um, candidates that are interested in pursuing teaching uh, positions here in Arlington, if we have openings. I also want to thank um, several of our curriculum directors and principals attended, and were and candidates were able to talk to to them who actually 
would be doing the hiring, been, been, who they'll be doing the interviewing of any uh, candidates when we have openings, and they got a good insight into what people are looking for here in Arlington in, in terms of the, the candidates and the qualifications that, they, that we need to have. Um, so over, all in all, it's a successful, uh, it was a successful event, and we are continuing the outreach post the event to try to um, identify uh, good candidates for open positions and um, communicate consistently with our curriculum directors and principals to, um, to meet those candidates. Thank you. And the last thing I want to um, mention is um, the news that we, ha we received this week uh, about the ranking in U.S. News & World Report for Arlington High School. Um, Arlington High School was ranked number 25, which is actually up one from where they had been, we had been ranked last year. And to put this in perspective, when the U.S. News & World Report did the ranking, they looked at 21,035 schools in the United States. And Arlington High School ranked 564th, which puts them in the top 2.9%. Um, in Massachusetts, they looked at 358 schools, and that's putting Arlington High School in the top 6.9%. So I, I think that this is a, um, a, a strong reflection of what a great education students are receiving in the Arlington schools because their success in Arlington High School begins a lot earlier than just the high school. It begins in preschool, uh, kindergarten, all the way up. So. We have a, a incredible staff throughout the whole district, and I, and, I, and, I, and I bring this up because this was actually National Teachers Week. Uh, right? Not the week, but there was a National Teachers Day on Tuesday. And I, and I think that uh, I want to take this opportunity just to say how proud we are of the teachers and the students we have in this district. They're really, um, they're so dedicated, talented, um, and caring for their students. And it shows, and it shows all the time in terms of how well our students do, and that comes from the nurturing that the teachers uh, give them, and the fact that they're very, also just very competent people, too. So that's a reflection of the whole district, and, and we're very proud of that. Now, of course, we would love to see ourselves even do better, and I think that that's uh, what we continue to try to do. So we have one of the teachers here tonight, so I want to thank Siobhan um, on behalf of for all the teachers in the district. Thank you. I, so that's, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'm amazed with uh, all the things that the teachers in the system do with what they, what little they have to go with. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, can, I make, can I make one more comment? Because sure. you did remind me, it's, talking about because one of the goals of the committee is to have cost-effective education our per pupil cost is a thousand dollars less than the state average so we are doing very well with the money that the town gives us and um, you know obviously we would love to have more but at the same at the same time I think that we um, make good use of what we have thank you <coughs> Subcommittee and liaison reports, policy and procedures. We meet on Monday, the 13th of May at 6 p.m. I believe that's I think correct. 6 p.m. And we are discussing policy CBI, the superintendent evaluation mm -hmm. policy. Thank you. Budget? Uh, we have not had a meeting. Obviously, we need to have a meeting so that we can set the goal um, around the money. Um, I also want to mention that uh, as budget chair um, and a member of the school committee. I'll be attending the MASC Day on the Hill on Tuesday the 21st, which is the Tuesday before our next meeting, um, in support of any items that would help with Arlington Public Schools. So if anybody has anything or plans to attend, let me know. I've set up meetings so far with uh, three out of the four, maybe five people that I want to meet with. So looking forward to that. We should talk. Yes. <laughs> I'm planning on attending, so I had already told you that. Yeah. I hope to, but I need to double check. Closer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Right. Community relations. Nothing to report. 
curriculum instruction and assessment and accountability. Nothing to report. Facilities, nothing to report. Legal services. Um, nothing to report, but we'll be scheduling a meeting this week. Good. Um, the chair, I'd just like to mention that uh, two of us attended the recent uh, EDCO uh, roundtable on superintendent evaluation. Uh, it was, I found it very interesting. What struck me was how many people were in attendance. Uh, the room was packed. The, uh, all but one member of the uh, Concord uh, School Committee uh, were there. And uh, so it was, that was interesting. Last uh, uh, Friday, uh, the chair and I attended uh, a Massachusetts Continuing Legal Education seminar, an all-day program on uh, school education, uh, which was very interesting. Um, the, I also attended on Saturday a, a, a MASC program on parliamentary procedure. Uh, I asked uh, Ms. Fitzgerald to give you a copy. Uh, this is in your package of rules. And uh, just a side note, uh, one of the things the, the presenter, fascinating presenter, or to, on a subject that I thought would have been very dull and boring, kept us all very riveted by chairs, indicated that a school committee chair, uh, it's recommended that they uh, do not participate in the actual discussion. Uh, if they do it, do it at the very end. So the past chairs have done an exemplary job on that. They also said that the chair should not um, vote unless it has an impact on changing the vote. Um, that first part about not participating I shared with my wife and she said if you told the board that they probably would have elected you chair the first night. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, moving on. Um, the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so request, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Does anybody wish to pull anything out of this? Yeah, I, I noticed uh, an error in the organizational minutes. Um, Oops. Yeah. Okay. okay. You want to? I wasn't there for, we need to pull April 11th out, both, both of, them. of them. Okay. So, so both of those I, will, I will hold that. Okay. That's it for now. Okay. Approval of warrant number 13155 dated April 25th, 2013. Total warrant amount $623,577.92. Uh, minutes for approval, regular minutes. Uh, both minutes did you want pulled out? Yeah. Both set? Yeah. Okay. So you have a and uh, so uh, April 25th, 2013. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Someone second it, please? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's take a look at the organizational meeting minutes, April 11, 2013. Mr. Schlickman? Uh, I, I did not make the motion um, on Mr. Uh, Thielman's nomination as I was in the chair, I believe. Uh, Mr. Pierce did? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I believe you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I was not at that meeting, so I can't mm -hmm. vote on his minutes. Okay. So fine. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you get that correction, Ms. Fitzgerald? No. So on the organizational meeting, mm -hmm. um, it was uh, Mr. Pierce who made the motion to recommend Mr. Thielman to the state school committee. Still trying to understand <laughs> what that means, but, but I don't really have it. That's why we did it when you weren't here. I don't think we did either. That's why you got it. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Do we now, move to approve them as amended? Yes. yes. So moved. Second. All those in favor of approving the April 11th, 2013 organizational meeting minutes as amended, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Abstentions. Right. Two abstentions. Two abstentions. <laughs> uh, and now we have the regular minutes of April 11th, 2013. Are there any amendments needed? No. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? <laughs> One. Okay. Uh, secretary's report. All right, let's see here. Come on. Mm -hmm. Just hit it. 
uh, correspondence for a school committee meeting on May 9th, 2013, we received the following correspondence. Uh, an invitation to the retirement party for Hardy Principal Deb D'Amico on Monday, June 3rd from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Arlington Center for the Arts. A copy of a letter to all school nurses to thank them for their service in honor of School Nurse Recognition Day on May 8th this year. Uh, that was from Dr. Bodie. Uh, email about school security. An email about Arlington teachers being able to enroll their children in the Arlington Public Schools. Uh, architects field report on the Thompson School rebuild. Draft of the minutes for school committee meetings on April 11th. The organizational meeting on April 11th and the regular meeting on April 25th. A letter from Judson Pierce to Sharon Grossman confirming and congratulating her on her appointment to the Human Rights Commission. The Commissioner's Weekly Update from Mitchell Chester, dated May 3rd, 2013. Uh, a copy of a flyer and the letter that went home to all parents about the pilot of the after-school Spanish immersion program next year at Brackett. And a copy of Judson's notes from the school committee retreat on April 13th, 2013. That's it. Um, going a little off the script, I will entertain a motion for a recess until 8.30. We have an executive session, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, yeah, we could do the executive I, session. I understand. Part of, of a conflict is because one member was not. Mm -hmm. I'll entertain. I'll leave to. it to the board. If, if the board wishes to go into executive session right now and then come back out for the, to deal with the table motion, that's fine. Go with the consensus. Think yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session with the intent to come out to deal with the tabled motion. Right. Somebody needs to. Do you have to read, or do you want, oh, want I, to read? Um, okay. I, I'll make the motion. Thank you, Paul. Um, I move that we go into executive session for the purpose of conducting strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with the union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Also to conduct strategy with respect to collective bar bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. <clears throat> Collective bargaining may also be conducted. We, we will return to open session to discuss the tabled item, which is the discussion of enrollment of out of district children of teachers in the Arlington Public Schools. And we anticipate that happening around 8.30 p.m. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Aye. 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 Just going along with what that said.
The Arlington School Committee is uh, back from executive session, back in the regular session. Um, Mr. Pierce, the chair, is here. I am now going to relinquish the chair back to the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I heard you were a very good interim chair, <laughs> Mr. Hanner, so I'm glad I'm back to fully resume my responsibilities. Um, I was at the Touchdown Club uh, event in Arlington tonight. I was attended by a lot of student athletes and coaches and, uh, and staff, and it was a really great night, and I sent our best regards to everyone there. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, you, do you, would you like a motion, make a motion, any oh. of you, to? I move that we uh, take uh, the item um, off the table, discussion of enrollment of out of district children of Second. teachers. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those against? Okay. Um, yeah, we should start with the motion, which is right here. Mr. Chair? Would you like to, to make yeah. a motion, sir? Uh, I move that uh, motion that beginning in 2013-2014 school year on a trial basis for the school year, the school committee shall permit the enrollment of school-age non-resident child, ch child residing with his or her parent or guardian who is employed as a teacher or other unit A position in the district subject to the restrictions outlined in the attached memorandum of agreement with the AEA. Second. Okay. Um, so this is how uh, I'd like to do this. Let's start out with um, discussion. First, each member um, maybe asking a question or making a comment, getting the superintendent's um, recommendations. First, superintendent's recommendations, and then we'll lead the discussion. So if you don't mind, Dr. Lodi. <coughs> oh, thank you. Um, my recommendation is that the school committee accept this and approve this MOA with the uh, AEA. Um, it is for one year as a trial. It is a, it is a statement of um, it is, it is a statement to the teachers that we are willing to invest in the retention of our teachers in the district. Um, this will be done on, only on a space available basis and that's, that's very clear in this and that would be true for any of the any children um, that would be applying for these open positions. None of the decisions will be made until August until we can see um, what the numbers are in each one of the classes because that's something that's a very dynamic process and continues to be. Another thing you should be aware, because uh, this question came up, when, a, when a, a, a teacher's child from another district does go to school here, we do receive the Chapter 70 money for that child. So I think that it is a opportunity um, to that will benefit not only our teachers, but will benefit our district as well because a number of districts do this and the, the, their reason for doing it is to provide incentives for retention of our teachers. Thank you. Um, I'd like, if, if I may, to call upon Ms. Ms. Foley to maybe say a few remarks regarding this motion. Sure, thank you. Um, I think a lot has been said all, sorry, sounds very loud. I think a lot has been um, said already. I think Alicia uh, Serafina um, put it very well and giving her personal perspective. She's an excellent teacher from everything that I've heard. Tino D'Agostino also has an interest in this, who's also an excellent teacher. Um, I think hearing from, from your teachers about what a benefit this is for them is, is very important for you to hear. As um, Dr. Bodhi has said, this is on a trial basis. We have met your concerns about um, the space availability, and this has been a two-year discussion. So um, we would please ask that the school committee please approve this. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, am I asking questions or making my statement? Uh, whichever you'd prefer. <clears throat> okay, I'll make my statement. I don't have questions at okay. this point. Um, so I'm, I wanted to take a moment to explain my vote. Um, I appreciate that the idea of accepting teachers' children has precedent in other districts, and it also has many positive effects. 
I appreciate and respect our teachers very much, and I would like to help them. However, I'm very concerned about potential crowding or overcrowding at the middle school level beginning in 2015 and beyond. We're already at a point where scheduling is difficult and we're going to potentially be adding 30 to 160 more students over the next few years. We haven't heard from the administration how this is when we hit capacity or even go over it. We don't know what's going to happen at the middle school. We understand that we don't feel that there needs to be a whole new bill, but we don't know what's going to happen. And I note in the pilot, even as a pilot, any child we accept into this program, we have until graduation, should their parents, teachers so choose, uh, which is great and right, but that means kids who are entering the people in for 2017, um, kids who are in second, third, fourth grade next year will be in the middle school and we'll be adding to the numbers that we're seeing then. And for this reason, I cannot in good conscience vote for this plan, um, appealing as it though it may be. Um, but it's also important to me that our votes in and out of executive session be consistent. So in aid of that, instead of voting no as I did uh, in executive session, I will be abstaining for this vote. Ms. Heim. Um, I, I did miss the executive session discussion on this, and so I apologize to um, my colleagues if some of this is redundant. Um, first, I do want to thank um, the union members that with whom we were working with, um, because I had two areas that I was extremely concerned about and had reservations about a policy. Um, the first was cost to this district. Um, if we ended up with a um, with a situation where the student needed um, services that uh, meant that we would need to spend a different amount of money than we typically allocate per student, what capacity do, did we as a district have to absorb that and what venues did we have? Um, I see that that has been accounted for in this final language and I want to thank those involved for that. Um, in terms of the class size piece, um, I do see that there's the determination of the superintendent and I would, um, I will in a moment ask her to speak to how she sees that process going because as the committee member that sat on the redistricting um, group, mm -hmm. it was very heart-wrenching at times to pretty much be in a situation where we had to say maybe your child doesn't get to go to school with your next door neighbor's child maybe if somebody new moves in they don't get to attend a school and unfortunately or fortunately i mean it's a sign of a good product a good quality education that we do have so many people wanting to use it but a number of our rooms are overcrowded and we have had to make very hard decisions around traditional boundary lines to provide students with equal access to the teachers. So in a moment, I will want you to ask about how you see that decision even occurring. Um, but the other component I really have concern about, and I think I'd shared this with some of um, our team, was the idea that if this is a pilot program, that we have an exception for siblings of those that are enrolled in the pilot year. And that, that might put us at a disadvantage if there is no space for having made a commitment to saying we would consider those siblings. Um, because the, as the pilot year, anybody that we take that pilot year, I understand that that, that student is going to be here for the duration. I read number eight to say, any siblings of that student would have a preferential opportunity for a seat in the Arlington Public Schools, even if the pilot doesn't get extended. And so I'd like, um, if you could, Dr. Bodhi, to talk about what that could, what potential for class size do you see that having? Because that concerns me even more, the idea that we're looking out so far and maybe binding ourselves. Well, first of all, um, let me address the question about the buffer zones because that was heart-wrenching and, and I know that that uh, potentially there are going to be some people who are not in their first choice district. 
But in terms of an, a priority order, people who are on the wait list in buffer zones would have first priority in my mind. And following that would be open enrollment requests because we do have um, a fair number of those, but those even are addressed after the wait lists have been taken care of. And then it's at that point, it's looking at what the availability is in the district. And these numbers will probably shift, so having a, a defined number right now would not, be, would not make sense. But the concept would be that we would not be uh, <coughs> adding any students to a class that would take it to the average class size in the district. So, I mean, we are a growing district, there's no doubt about it, but we also have some classes that are small. And this is one of the issues we've been looking at for redistricting, is that even at a particular grade level, we have ranges. And we can have class sizes that range from 19 to 27. I mean, that happens at a grade level. So, and, the redistricting, I believe, is start, are we starting to see a little bit of the effect of trying to equalize it, but I think it's going to take a number of years before that really uh, <coughs> completely, and I'm not even sure it will ever completely change the fact we'll have ranges. I just hope the ranges become more narrow. So that would be the, um, the decision-making process that would go through, but I would not want anybody to think that, that they're in a buffer zone, that they would not uh, their preference would be superseded by this. That would not be the case. But also the other piece of that is um, I have a class of 19 in one fifth grade classroom. I have a class of 24 in a different fifth grade classroom. Next year when they're in sixth grade, I would hope for some equity. How is that? Um, in one way, you could say that that class, what number did I say? I'm sorry. 19. That 19. class of 19 <laughs> has five openings. But in another way, if we're looking at a class size of, let's say, 22 for sixth grade is optimum, it doesn't. How are you going to be making those decisions about how many seats there really are to even put forth to, to staff members? The, well, the, the example you gave is fifth grade, um, and what is going to happen with class sizes, and, and probably looking, quite honestly, at fourth and fifth grade, because as Dr. Ampey was saying, what, what is going to be the effect at Otteson the following year, because when they all come together and then you divide it by the number of classrooms, what is that going to do to the, the class numbers? I mean, that is a valid a valid concern, and it's one of the ones that I'm going to have to look at. And uh, when I uh, brought the numbers to the committee, which are a little bit outdated even now because it's a dynamic process, th th that's something that I'm going to have to look at analytically just to, s to see what the effect would be. My, the, we were given some indication of what people who might be interested in this program what the spread would be of the of the students and we're talking if there's an opening say at a fifth grade that you know we may only even have one student that's interested in so we're not seeing uh, an impactful thing at a particular grade level that's one thing i can say so the impact at any given grade level from data that i have seen would be one to three people so your determinant I mean, really is going to be what our open seats are, absolutely. not where the interest is. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And even that provision you mentioned about siblings, the agreement is, again, it's still on a space available basis. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thielman? I'll, I'll be voting in the affirmative. I think that, you know, we've talked about this over the past couple of contract cycles with the teachers union, and we agreed that we would study this and we finally got a study and we finally got to a point where we can vote on something. I think it's a pilot program it's, and so it's worth a try. And secondly, it's an, it's an attempt in a very competitive market for teachers mm -hmm. to attract uh, teachers to our district and retain teachers in mm -hmm. our district. And I think that, so I see this as a, as a tool for 
Retra uh, attracting talent and uh, retaining talent. <coughs> Mr. Schlickman. I, I agree with everything that Mr. Thielman said. Philosophically, uh, I, I think this is an excellent policy to put in place. I must say that during the executive session, um, when, when I started to look at this and compare this out to enrollment numbers, uh, I was starting to get a little nervous uh, because our numbers are tight in many places. And I had to take a deep breath and say, yes, this is the right thing to do in terms of public policy, but yes, we can do this because uh, we have excellent leadership in the district, and I, I can feel confident that uh, decisions will be made uh, that will uh, not uh, have a negative impact on the kids already in our classrooms, so that uh, we will be putting uh, uh, the, the children of our teachers into classrooms where there is indeed space available, and we're not going to have an overcrowding situation as a result of this policy. Um, and with that, I will uh, am prepared to vote in the affirmative again. Thanks. Ms. Starks. Mm -hmm. um, I still just have one question. So I understand that space dictates who we let in, mm -hmm. but once a child is in, they are in through mm -hmm. 12th grade, whether mm -hmm. we have space or not, mm -hmm. correct? So we let them in in second grade, but when they move to third grade, it turns out we also have an influx of five new third graders, and there really isn't room. We still have them there. So even though they now put us over, and we, and are they in the same school? If moving them to another school in their new grade would help alleviate that, do we have the right to do that? So say they come in second in bracket, because that's where the hole was. In third grade, when we get the numbers for third grade, a set of triplets has moved into third grade, and now there is no room in third grade. But it turns out somebody in Bishop moved out, and so now there's a space in Bishop. Do we move them? Our policy on open enrollment has been, well, it, it did, it, it evolved. Years ago, we had that policy that every year it was reevaluated. The committee decided that that was not, a, not the preferred policy, but they'd rather have a child, once they're open enrolled in a school, they remain in the school. And uh, I believe that that would be uh, applicable here, though, it, Mr. Hainer? I, I just, the primary piece of wording in this document is space available. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that you would have the authority, mm -hmm. if appropriate, to move the child. Now, I appreciate the, the importance of, of continuity and everything in the child, but that's, we that's, made a big thing. I, whether it would be defined that way, but it was understood, space available. I don't see this. I would agree with Mr. Schlickman. I'm sorry, I'm talking out of order. I just want to well, well, finish. It's, um, it's, but we've had we've had two minds on this, and under this policy, the superintendent retains the authority to make those determinations. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer is yes, they could be moved, but would that be the intent? Probably not, unless the numbers became so egregiously unbalanced um, that made the only thing that made sense. Because I think the thing that I worry about is although initial placement, you know, yes. it mm -hmm. goes by the buffers and then open enrollment, once a child is in there, now we have another child. <coughs> and so the next year when we're looking at buffer zones and open enrollment, now they are, they're in there and they are bumping potential other Arlington children. Right. And that was... I mean, I would hate for someone to not get a placement in their local mm -hmm. school because the numbers in that school no longer allow it because we let in three people. You know, it, the problem mm -hmm. is, is that right now we're so tight mm -hmm. that I feel like it really is a numbers game. If it was, if we were at, you know, seven classes of 17, 18, 19 on average, I would have no issue with this, but we aren't. You know, we have very few classes that are under 20. 
and mm -hmm. lots and lots that are way over 20. And I just feel like the problem is, is that we're already with, with all of the uh, redistricting and open enrollment requests that we have. I mean, I feel like this is gonna restrict our ability to meet those even more. And while I truly wish that we had the space, um, and I know that it's on space available, but like I said, once they're in, we own them through their graduation. And so I'm just worried that, you know, yeah, we, maybe we only have space for five every year, but that's five every year. And that's five that we own through their graduation. And I'm just concerned about, I'm really concerned about class size. Mm -hmm. Well, the school committee up until just a couple years ago had open enrollment, which essentially this is the tier below open enrollment, um, reevaluated every year. And, and I know that I've done that um, in my role as assistant superintendent and even the year I was doing both jobs. Look at uh, look at that issue until the, until it changed. And there were instant there were a couple instances where we did move students between schools. Um, so that is something that has been a precedent here in the district, and and I would assume that it could remain because right now there is no policy other than the superintendent's discretion on this. Anything else? Mr. I, I am an advocate for, for this and will vote for it for two reasons. One, by law, I have to since I negotiated and it came about with the tentative agreement. Aside from that, I think the language that has come, come to you is so very strong on a management point that the, 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 the power is in the superintendent's hand. Mm -hmm. I appreciate and applaud her because she's going to have to do all the work. And I don't expect, and from what I've heard, I think I'm interpreting it right, Dr. Bodie will not be looking at just the slot for the next year, but looking at the following years and the impact where that would come. As far as siblings, again, only if space is available. If there is no space available, and that determination, again, I would hope would be the same type of looking forward and ahead like that. It's a one-year pilot. Is it a gamble? Yes. Is it a high-risk gamble? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm a strong proponent on lower class sizes uh, like that. Thank you. Okay, let me explain my vote. Um, in executive session, I decided to abstain from this. Uh, as a matter of self-interest, I thought that I had a conflict with my two young elementary school children. Um, having further reflected on it and having discussed the potential of conflict, with town council, um, uh, I feel able to vote on this tonight. Um, what's interesting is by abstaining, um, I was thinking about my interest in terms of not wanting my child in a class that was ballooning. And we, we've all seen that here. We've seen a lot of that in our elementary schools. Um, but what I've, what I've come to realize over the last week or so is that, that and, and what I've known really for 10 years, is that this is a family first town. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we're doing in a very small and modest way with a one year trial MOA is showing our teachers that they are our family too and their families come first. And, um, I respect my fellow committee members so much for um, the arguments against because, believe me, I shared and do share some of those concerns now. Uh, but I feel comfortable voting yes on this tonight. Um, in part, it, um, you know, it, it strikes me as coincidental that it's, it's teacher appreciation week, right? And um, we certainly don't show enough how much we care and respect what you guys do. And um, we try every day, and we're gonna improve on that every day. And it's certainly not always a dollar figure or, a, you know, but it, it, it's, it's, it's in other ways that we really truly appreciate and care about you and your family. So um, that is why I'm gonna vote 
yes on this uh, right now. So is there any further discussion before we take the vote? Ms. Hine. Um, I'd just like to explain my vote because since the other members have, um, I actually came in here with the intent of um, not supporting this because of my concerns around the um, long-term implications. And even though this is called a one-year pilot, the reality is this is a 13-year commitment if somebody gets accepted into kindergarten this year. This is not really, it's a one-year pilot on accepting kids. It's not a one-year pilot program that we're, we're consenting to. Um, and I did have concerns about that, but in listening to Dr. Bodie, around the determination of what qualifies as class size and, um, and the having listened over the past couple of years to the teachers talk about their commitment to the town of Arlington and to educating the children of Arlington, um, I have actually changed my position on this for today and, and it is with reservations but I will be voting yes and that that vote really comes solely on the superintendent's commitment to ensure appropriate, educationally appropriate class size for our students. And um, I would hope that if there is consideration for extending this pilot, that um, the language for how those positions get determined gets memorialized at some point so that in the future, if Dr. Bodie 20 years down the line, decides she wants to retire to a beach somewhere. Um, <laughs> we, can, we can still have language that we know will ensure that the benefits given are not on the backs of our youngest students mm -hmm. and reducing their access to um, great educational leaders. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker? Sure. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to just comment. Uh, thank the committee for their careful consideration of this. Thank the subcommittee members who came earlier and spoke, Todd and Alicia, um, and, uh, and for their work on this subcommittee and their passion that they've showed um, and their concern for the, the district and, and their, you know, their, really their, um, their support for the district and that they think they teach here, they think it's a great district, they'd like their kids to go to school here, and I think um, they've really shown that. Um, and um, so I... I, I also want to reiterate what uh, Dr. Bodhi said earlier that you know these when we do accept these students if we do accept these students if there's space they become Arlington students for purposes of chapter 70 money they become basically resident students in the eyes of the state mm -hmm. so just uh, that is uh, a factor also to consider mm -hmm. okay any further discussion okay let's call the vote all those in favor aye, aye. aye. all those against all those abstaining one. Okay, so that six one. Six oh one. Six oh one. <laughs> God. That's all right. Would you accept the motion to adjourn? Um, before I accept your motion, um, I'd just like to personally wish all the mothers a uh, happy Mother's Day mm -hmm. coming up this Sunday. Uh, happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 nurses. And, nurses. and Nurses Day. And Nurses. Nurses, nurses week Appreciation yes. Week, too. Well, then, okay. Happy Nurses. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! Yes, we uh, a little bird whispered in my ear that the, we have a birthday in the in the house. <laughs> We're not going to sing to you. We promise. Well, <laughs> very happy birthday. Hope you hope you had fun. Yeah, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll Motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank this you. Is the